You are entering the MSP Zone, a podcast for the managed services community, covering news, analysis, and interviews from around the globe. Elevate your MSP game by staying in the MSP Zone. And now, your host, Charles Weaver. All right. Uh, very excited to have our uh, guests join us today from, uh, I guess, well, you guys are not in remote locations. I'm in a remote location, um, but at least we're on the same time zone, uh, which is nice. Um, we're going to be talking about the MGM and Caesars security incident. And uh, a lot has been said and written about this um, from a lot of different vantage points. And I thought that uh, we'd get the vantage point, not only of people who live in Las Vegas, not that that's particularly anything, but you guys have some access to information that we might have not not heard of, but also people who we know about and trust very, very much in the cyber community. And um, very, very happy to have Shannon Wilkinson and Brent Watkins from Tago Cyber. Uh, guys, welcome to MSP Zone. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Charles. Awesome. Uh, for those who don't uh, know who Tago Cyber is or what you guys are doing, could uh, Shannon maybe give us a little bit of a brief uh, overview of what you guys are, are up to? Yeah, 100%. So uh, Tago is essentially, you boil our value prop down to the basic uh, thing. It is finding bad guys faster. So Tago is an integration app for Amazon Security Lake and Splunk. Um, and using Tego really means reducing mean time to detection and mean time to response for our customers um, by performing and automating threat detection searches at speed and at scale. Um, so basically, Tego matches the security log data of the customer to our highly contextualized threat um, intelligence database with an Amazon Security Lake or Splunk. And then our, we enable essentially threat-driven security operations and uh, help security operations teams be more efficient. Do you call yourself an a SIM or an EDR platform, or is that not what you like to be called? No, we actually enhance those platforms and add additional capabilities that they might not have already. Um, so we're we're trying to, like I said, you know, enable the security operations centers to be more efficient um, by having our threat detection, and then um, backed, of course, that threat detection is backed by uh, high fidelity and highly contextualized threat intelligence. So uh, we don't just say, you know, hey, analyst, bad IP address, but we tell them why it's bad and why they need to be concerned. But because we're sitting on top of those SIM platforms and those data lake platforms, we're also able to give a list of the assets that are affected and build an investigative timeline for the analyst in just a couple of seconds. Whereas, you know, if they had to do that manually, it would probably take, you know, hours for them to maybe put that information together. Very exciting. Uh, just, just curious. Yeah, go ahead, Brent. Yeah, sorry. No, I said it's very excited, which is why I work for this firm. I've known Shannon since I was an FBI agent here doing cyber work in Las Vegas, and when they uh, offered me a position to come aboard and help, I couldn't turn it down because uh, they know what they're doing. That's awesome. Are, uh, are, are you courting MSPs? I mean, are, are MSPs uh, using Tago uh, overlaying, as you said, on their existing uh, security stack? Yes, 100%. Actually, MSPs and MSSPs are our are, are deal uh, partners um, because they have that trusted relationship with the clients already. And a lot of them are providing those services uh, to their clients. So it's kind of the perfect partnership for Tago. Excellent. Well, at the end, we'll, we'll get back to how they can get in touch with you guys and get some more information about Tago. For now, let's shift to MGM and Caesars. Um, I read a lot about this stuff. I saw some pretty conflicting or inconsistent data and analysis, uh, I would call it. And maybe that was just because it was in the early days. Things may have settled, but you know, either of you, I don't know, Brent or Shannon, who, who wants to go first, but what happened? And, and for those that don't know, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think these both happened in relatively short succession. Like I think in the same week as I heard, but mm -hmm. can you just describe what happened with MGM and Caesars? Let me jump in ahead of time. Just say we are not here to point fingers at MGM or Caesars. No. Okay, I just want to make that clear. This is not going to be Monday morning quarterback. We'll tell you what we know, what we think we know, but we're not here to make anybody look bad because this is a tough business. These ransomware attacks have become 
uh, just like the uh, advanced persistent threats were back 10 years ago. It's a serious, when they see serious money, they'll put forth a serious effort. So I just wanted to preface it by that. We are not here to criticize anybody. Yeah, Good and actually point. a lot of our friends work in the industry, work right. at those properties, and they've had a really tough uh, month or so. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, I, that's look, guys, um, fair, fair point, and I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, our purpose of even having this episode and having both of you on is is to learn something at, you know that could be gleaned from what happened and and help MSPs and their customers protect themselves a little bit better because mm-hmm. every every one of these things every time it happens there's something that can be learned so yeah good good point yeah one hundred percent so I think um, you know going to the actual attacks and what happened um, both of them from what we know started off with social engineering attacks on the help desk um, targeting basically admin uh, accounts for the Okta system um, to gain access to the system. So essentially having somebody call in to the help desk. Um, from what I understand, uh, Caesars was a third-party help desk, and I think MGM has their own. Um, so there were those um, you know, differences. But again, help desk, sophisticated social engineering attack, Um, basically got MFA credentials reset, uh, gained administrative access to Okta, and then basically pivoted. Um, You know, we always talk about uh, within the organizations, like, you know, protecting kind of the border. And, you know, if you have MFA, you know, you're safe and stuff like that. But the attackers have become very sophisticated with their social engineering attacks that, you know, there's now a big question of like, how do you fend your, uh, your help desk and your IT personnel against these really sophisticated um, social engineering attacks? And, you know, there's the common phrase of humans are the weakest link within cybersecurity, um, which kind of annoys me because I'm actually a firm believer that if you take time to invest in training and also, you know, not not just your you know annual cybersecurity training, but you keep your staff abreast of the newest attacks, then humans and, and your staff can also be one of your strongest lines of defense. Um, so in the case of both MGM and Caesars, you know, Okta, one of the technologies used in the attack, released a warning at the end of August that they were seeing an uptick in social engineering attacks against their customers. <laughs> you know, I can't help but wonder, you know, hey, the vendor is saying social engineering attacks against our customers. I, I wonder if that information ever made it down to the help desk staff at Caesars and MGM, you know, being that those were the very people that were being targeted by the attacks. So, you know, we're were the help desk people set up for failure because they had no idea that these type of attacks were coming at them. So social engineering, um, Brent, maybe over to you on this, because I, I'm sure you've seen this in, in your, in your past life and in working cases, they know who they want. They know at least the department that they want to target. They get the, they narrow down or they absolutely zero in on a person. And then they go into the help desk and say, I am that person. Help me reset my credentials, and then that's that's their ticket in. Did I get it right? Yeah, yeah, you did. And you know, it's it's an evolution. What have we been talking about for fifteen years or more? Don't click the link, you know. And that's where the whole the human is the weakest link and everything. And I've never bought that. Uh, you know, education can only go so far when all you're talking about is clicking links. But now you're getting into a more sophisticated situation where you are impersonating someone who you've learned about on LinkedIn, and then you've gone to one of the $20 uh, research sites you can find out all kinds of information, where they live, who their neighbors are, anything that you want to know about their family. And it's not hard to dig up stuff on people like this. And that gives you a starting point to do some serious attacks based on you being a certain person. And uh, it's a it's it's not it it we haven't we have seen it before. It's not brand new, but it's really as far as the predominance, it's becoming more and more popular because it works. And that's why yeah. ransomware is more popular now today too. It works, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. So I I, I do want to I want to get to the ransomware and how how both uh, Caesars and, and MGM handle it because the, from my understanding they handle it in very different ways. Right. Mm-hmm. But Shannon, back to your your description of what Tago does. And there's a lot of tools that, that would fit into wh- how, what MSPs use in their tech stack, right? EDR, mm-hmm. Splunk, SIM, SIM products. Is, 
if 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 we are correct in saying that security is a layered approach, it's not one wall; it's multiple walls, multiple doors, multiple mm-hmm. locks. Um, if the social engineering was going to happen, and the change management process, whatever it was, was defeated, is the, is there a lesson also to be learned about? And maybe it did work, but did they did they spot the bad actor? in time and is that something that MSPs and their customers ought to be looking at as well with the internal kind of EDR MDR style internally focused technologies does, does that make sense yeah no absolutely and you know one of the things that uh, people might not realize about the MGM attack was all those systems that were offline some of them were preemptively taken offline by MGM to avoid damage to those systems. So it wasn't that the ransomware actors, um, you know, were able to get in and shut down everything all by themselves. MGM actually said, hey, to contain the spread of this attack and make sure that they don't hit some of our very critical systems, we're actually going to take them offline so that they are not accessible to the attackers. So that's something that folks might not know about. That's a really great point because when this first started happening, People were like, don't they know anything about network segmentation? Don't they know how to do this and that? And people don't realize like some of the UHS uh, medical systems hack a couple of years ago, like 11 properties across the country went down like that. That's because mm-hmm. they shut them down. They didn't, you know, they weren't sure what was going on. Something was happening, but they shut those down preemptively. So it's not always because the hackers get everywhere they want and the, through the entire network across the country as these companies are smart enough to shut them down to really be able to assess what's going on. Yeah. And, and there was a lot of information also shared by the, you know, attackers behind uh, yeah. the attack, you know, online and everything like that. And I would just say, you know, some of that may be true, but at the same time we have to take it with a grain of salt because, um, Attackers have been known to lie through their teeth about what they've gained access to, you know, the data that they've stolen. Um, You even have, in certain cases with ransomware attacks, multiple ransomware groups taking uh, credit for it. So, you know, it leads to the question, you know, who's telling the truth and what really happened? And I think only time will tell um, and the details that NGM and Caesar shares with us. Um, you know, only, only that will tell, you know, exactly what happened. Um, you know, we can't just take what the attackers from Alpha V posted online and, and take that as truth of this is what really happened. Can we chalk something good up to the MGM team that shut it down? Brent, back to your point that, I mean, in, in light of not knowing what's going on, not knowing what the true impact of a, of a known or suspected breach shutting down uh, what else what could they have done i I think i think that does speak volumes as far as them having a a grip on what's going on from moment to moment in their network and they see something like that happen it really makes the recovery process a little bit less complicated to do and therefore you're not recover recovering 100 terabytes of data an hour which is impossible but uh You know, you just get to focus on a few key assets at once and then move from there. You don't have to try to just recover the entire thing right at once. So I I think, uh, did that answer the question? I think you, I've lost track here. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Right. I mean, I I think shutting down, yeah, like they may have gotten a bad rap and beaten up in the press by the the revenue lost. People can't get into their rooms and and the Mm -hmm. kind of the social impact of the tech, um, you know, shut down. But I, I think... I, I hate to say it, but I don't hate to say it. I think it was a good thing that they did that in light of everything that they yeah. knew at the time. What yeah. else could they have done other than let this uh, group in there and do do more havoc? Yeah, right. exactly. You know, it, it would have been probably a nightmare for them to just leave everything on and, you know, not know where the ha- attackers were in their environment and then, you know, have – Uh, critical services taken offline by the attackers rather than them preemptively, you know, essentially securing and saving the systems that were critical to the business. Uh, One of the things also with the MGM that I think is like, because it was um, the resorts and the casinos, it was very much in the public eye, you know, all over social media, people, you know, complaining long lines and check-in and stuff like that. 
um, I think that's unique to the MGM and the cyber attack because these type of activities occur all the time at manufacturing plants. Um, mm. You know, it also occurs at hospitals. Hospitals usually also do hear about it because, you know, they might have to divert patients and occasionally divert ambulances and, you know, go back to pen and paper. But with, you know, manufacturing, um, you know, the, the general public doesn't feel any of the impact of the cyber attack until, like, we're seeing now, you know, Hidden Valley Ranch and Clorox Bleach, there's shortages because of a ransomware attack on the Clorox company. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about response after the after MGM shutting it down. Uh, Caesars and MGM had two starkly different approaches to a, a long term uh, settlement of, of their situation. Um, I think I have it right. Caesars paid. MGM did not. Did I get that right? Yes, correct. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, I just saw that the uh, administ the administration, our U.S. administration, um, went to a group. I don't know if it was the G7 or one of the summits, and they said, "Look, we want to have some consensus about not paying ransomware, mm -hmm. and let's let's all pledge together not to 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 pay ransomware." And I know Brent, you and I have been talking about OFAC and the, and the Treasury Department cracking down on that. Any observations or thoughts or comments about just you know, one group that said, we're going to pay it, we're going to get back online. Another said, no, we shut it down, we're not going to pay these guys, and we're, you know, we're going to figure it out the, the hard way. Um, yeah. Thoughts? Yeah, well, the FBI, I mean, Brent, you probably speak to this a little bit better, but the FBI is always advised not to pay the ransoms because essentially you're you're helping fund criminal enterprise and they're, they're, they're run like enterprises or like organizations. And what they do is when they successfully um, hold an organization hostage with a ransomware attack, they then take any money that they get and reinvest into their technology, reinvest to making their future attacks even better. So... Um, you know, on the flip side for an organization that's been hit and being held ransom, you know, it's, it's a, a rock and a hard place kind of situation, you know, Caesars, yeah, we're going to pay, you know, an estimated $15 million is what has been reported online, um, that they paid to the attackers to maintain their systems. And, um, during the attack, there were lots of rumors circulating around online and in Reddit groups about the fact that there had been an attack on Caesars. Um, that was not actually confirmed until a few days into the MGM attack. And I think the news came out, yeah, Caesars was hit last week. Um, you know, with the MGM, you know, deciding not to pay the ransom and, and follow kind of the FBI's advice on, on not paying ransoms. I, I think they, that, you know, I, I think it was the right decision for them because, uh, you know, they preemptively shut down their systems. Um, yeah, it did take them 10 days to get everything back online, but they're a massive organization. And if you can imagine, you know, an organization taking down all their computer systems and then bringing them back up, but not only just you know, taking them all offline and bringing them back up, but you have to, while you're doing that, be investigating and making sure, you know, hey, are the attackers truly out of our system or are they, you know, have they built in any back doors? Are they still lingering? Are, are we sure that if we bring on like our, our websites and stuff like that, that the attackers aren't still in our environment and they can attack them when we bring those systems back online? So I think yeah. actually MGM did an amazing job in, you know, yeah. preemptively taking their systems down making sure that the systems were secure and then planning out, you know, bringing back critical services, um, you know, slowly, methodically, um, and, and making sure, you know, that they were, they were safe in doing so. Yeah, I totally agree. <clears throat> as far as the payment aspect, you mentioned, you know, when ransomware first started, I was working the first cases with CryptoLocker back in 2014. And it was like, uh, no one thought, should we pay them or not? Everybody paid them because they were small, they were small dollar amounts. And then as that grew, you know, uh, the FBI and the government were saying, no, don't pay these people because they'll just keep doing it. And then they took a lot of heat over that. And then they started saying such things, I'll just paraphrase. Well, we don't really recommend you pay it, but if you need to pay it to keep your business working and you keep from going out of business, you may want to think about it as a business process and make the smartest risk decision. And now they're back to don't pay anybody. But I think mm -hmm. everybody realizes it's going to be an individual decision. Yeah.
And uh, although I, I do have to say, I do believe there are certain areas um, where there are compliance and regulatory um, requirements for if you're hit with a ransomware attack and you pay the ransom, you have to report it to a, a certain authority or, or body. And I, I do believe there are also some state governments that have banned the payment of ransomware payments uh, within the state by government agencies. So um, definitely need to be aware of whatever rules and regulations are in your area regarding ransomware payments. Uh, super important for MSPs listening to this. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I want to turn to MSP lessons that they can learn and, and apply to their customers, the managed services customers. The, the first step is the change management aspect of both, both the Caesars and the MGM um, uh, attacks. Uh, judgment aside, is there, I mean, following changing process, doing something that they have been doing previously and changing that moving forward? Is there anything along the lines of change management at the help desk or network operations center level that MSPs ought to consider in, in light of these two attacks? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Brett touched on it. You know, social media platforms and the internet have made it really easy to gather information about organizations and their employees. Um, and we might not necessarily be able to stop the attackers from calling in and scamming the help desk, but maybe MSPs and organizations can arm their help desk employees with some tools to stop the attackers by, um, maybe they can add some steps to verify the identity of the person calling. And so the question becomes, you know, for the MSPs and organizations, how does your help desk verify that the person they're talking to is really truly the person that they say they are? And that's where I think solutions like identity access management, IAM, come in. Um, you know, so the help desk is not just taking the word of the person on the phone, but they're actually taking steps to authenticate the person's identity before, you know, taking any, any actions to reset passwords or, um, you know, reset MFA tokens and stuff like that. And there, there's a slew of new providers in the IAM space that are looking to solve that question um, and challenge and answer the challenge of verifying identity. Um, and I an anticipate a lot of MSPs are probably going to be looking at um, those solutions providers and, and may also, you know, be getting questions from their clients of, you know, hey, what can we do here? Well, I, I, I think that that's probably a, an understatement that the MSPs ought to be using these new technologies. Because I can tell you for 20, 30 years, MSPs have looked at their knock and help desk as the customer service heart, the epicenter mm -hmm. of what they do. 100%. And they want to do a good job and they want to deliver a good service. But I think then they now have to say, we, we, can, we can do a, and deliver a good service, but we can't do that and make it simplistic. We, we have mm -hmm. to take the change management process very seriously and, and yep. even up our game a little bit. Yeah, yeah. and I think uh, just to add on to that, when I left the FBI in 2016, I worked in corporate America for almost a year and a half and I was the director of corporate security, but if I wanted my credentials reset or lost my password or whatever, I had to get the vice president of corporate security to also weigh in there and send an email saying, yes, He's legit. You can do this. It's a little extreme, but it makes the point. You know, if you only have one way to check somebody out to see if they're legitimate or not, and you, you may want to throw another, you want another minor minor process into your major process. Just a thought. Yeah. Yeah. No, one hundred percent. And then we could put on our little tinfoil hats and start talking about deep fakes and stuff like that, which adds a new whole uh, uh, line of complexity into yeah. you know how do you verify identity when you can fake a person's voice, you can fake a video of them. So, um, but yeah, that that would not, probably be a whole other conversation. And <laughs> no, and that's not that's not science fiction. Science fiction anymore. That's real. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I should probably kill me for throwing this out, but Rachel Toback in our na in our uh, industry does nothing but training, in addition to fishing, but on these newer social engineering aspects as far as the voices, the, the pictures, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, Rachel's got some outstanding training there that goes far and beyond just fishing. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. No, yeah. 100%. 
And, so, and, so, yeah, go ahead, Shannon. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I was going to point on uh, one other thing about the attacks that, you know, also MSPs can maybe start thinking about um, in talking with their mm -hmm. clients about is about vulnerability management, which can be kind of a touchy subject for MSPs and the organizations that they serve. Um, because you, you have maybe some of those organizations that take the attitude, you know, hey, we'll patch when we get around to it because, you know, who's going to target us? Um you know, I would say the problem with that attitude, of course, is the attackers aren't specifically looking for like Aunt Sally's cookie shop, but you know, they're scanning the internet. And if Aunt Sally has those vulnerable servers, they're going to show up on the scan. And guess what? Now she's a target. Um, so I think organizations need to look at, you know, looking at the recent Las Vegas attacks, you know, some organizations also take the, the viewpoint of that they'll only um, prioritize patching externally facing servers, so things that are publicly addressable on the internet and stuff like that, and then they leave a massive amount of technical debt within the organization and internally. Um, and looking at the recent Las Vegas attacks, you know, you can kind of go out on a limb to point out that, you know, that patching and vulnerability management strategy of only patching what's, uh, you know, internal externally facing doesn't really work because once an attacker is successfully pulled off one of these social engineering attacks, they're no longer external to the organization, they're inside. And if you have any existing vulnerabilities, let's say maybe to VMware servers, then those vulnerable machines are very easy to get, um, very easy to access, exploit the vulnerabilities and attack them and potentially shut them down, you know, delete data, steal data, et cetera. So, you know, Vulnerability management is definitely a solution that I think all MSPs should be looking at offering their clients, but then also somewhat providing regular reports on the progress or lack of progress of the clients on what the MSP is um, recommending, because I think the last thing an MSP or MSSP wants to do is, let's say something happens at the client and they do have a successful cyber attack um, and those vulnerable machines are attacked. Um, you know, they shouldn't be blamed because the client refused to listen to their recommendations. And I think those status reports will actually be a good way for the MSPs to have coverage and, and somewhat have the ability to go, hey, told you so. Yeah. You you, you said no EDR. You said no yeah. SIM. You said 100%. no MFA. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well. Yeah. All right. I don't want to say, okay, if the first line of defense, the change management breaks down. Um but if it does, plan B. It's got to be the internal facing tools that monitor the MSP or, and the customer, the managed services customer uh, environment, the network, and picking up the anomalies and picking up the you know, odd behavior of a maybe a, probably an admin user that looks legitimate, but they're doing some very weird stuff. What, what, if anything, can we learn about that other than just tech, MSP should have those technologies on board and working? No, absolutely. And uh, hopefully those solutions are also automated and just, you know, churning through the security logs on a regular basis. You know, not only going forward, but also looking backward in time. Um, Tago does that. You know, we call it recursive searching. But basically, you know, hey, when we learn about threats, they've usually been weaponized for a little bit of time. So we need to go backward. You know, hey, were the attackers in your environment two weeks ago, one month ago, three months ago? That type of um, activity, you know, needs to be automated and constantly going. And then also, you know, really making sure that you have access to all of those critical security logs. So we look at, you know, at Tego, we kind of call it kind of legacy SIM platforms, but, you know, the ones that charge you not on ingest. And because the customers are paying for ingest fees, um, they make decisions sometimes on, you know, hey, I can't send any more data to my SIM platform because I'm going to have to pay, you know, increased licensing fees. So they actually choose not to send critical security logs into their SIM platform because they don't want to, you know, take the risk of, of having to pay more annually for their costs. And, and that's a big problem for organizations. So hopefully MSPs aren't, aren't doing that, but that's a consideration. Yeah. I, I, well, I, I know that there's a lot of MSPs. I, I know there's a lot of reactive IT shops out there who, who rely on, let's say, vulnerability scanning and maybe a point in time or non-persistent, non-ongoing kind of just scanning. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I mean, for the for the mature MSPs out there, they probably already know the answer to this. But I'd, I'd love both of your uh, your your input on why that why that one time or every quarter just a scanning approach isn't enough to catch these types of things uh, when they happen. Oh, yeah. Well, I've got a good statistic from the University of Maryland, which is basically a computer connected to the internet is attacked every, um, I think, 38 seconds, about 2,200 times per day. Um, something's hitting that connected computer. Um, now, you know, that's one computer. Now, if your organization multiplied by 10, 1,000, 10,000, and you just see the massive amounts of potential malicious activity that might be hitting an organization. Um, and if you just scan once a quarter, you're only seeing it at that snapshot in time. You're not seeing all that daily activity um, that could potentially be hitting the organization and breaching the organization. Good point. Brent, anything to add to that? Um, I think Shanna covered it pretty well. I just, you know, again, these attacks, <clears throat> based on everything we've said here, I just want to bring it back. These attacks can be very difficult to stop because someone that wants to get in to your network, given enough time and resources, can. I used to say, I thought there was one company in my entire FBI career. I used to think to myself, they are never going to suffer an intrusion or a hack. And three years later, it was in the headlines, you know, they got, but, but, you know, there is no one's immune to this and uh, it's just getting harder. Every, every time we come up with something like EDR, for example, you know, what Charles at our conference, we had what, two years ago, there was a guy up there saying, if you're not into EDR, you're falling behind, you know, yeah. and that was true at the time. But I don't think it's so true now. I think it's leveling off the usefulness, usefulness of, of EDR it's just like anything else. It ramps up quick. It's the best stuff, kind of slows down, and then it's no longer the best stuff. Why? Because the hackers have figured out a way around it. They see all this new stuff come online. They figure out a way around it. And that, what I was going to add there, because of that and because of some of the things we've already talked about, I, I have a friend who said, I spent $23 million on my cybersecurity budget, and they gave me $7 million more and I tried to figure out what to do with it. So I looked around, I cost some things out, and I went back to the CEO and I said, we need to buy insurance. That was, <laughs> that was, that was you know, and there's not, that's funny, that's but good. there's something really true about that to think about. Is that, no. you know, you can't, there's law of diminishing returns in security as far as the money goes. So you can't write insurance out of this. And apparently mm -hmm. MGM has a good, cover, has good coverage on this. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't help your brand necessarily uh but it helps you financially uh, side point i don't think anyone cares that mgm got hacked i think the people that were there having the difficulties getting in and out they're always going to say something bad about it but you know we have the f1 this week mgm every 13 properties they have will be full you know mm -hmm. it, it, i just don't think brand problems in, in vegas are like any other place and even those yeah. other places the brand your brand damage disappears in what like nine weeks you know, if you look at the way fat, how fast things move, now yeah. that may not be the case for a small MSP. You know, I'm just talking about MGM, but for a small MSP and Charles, you're the expert on this. I, I don't know how that would factor into a smaller MSP. It could be devastating, but I, I, I take, I take your, both of your points that, you know, it's, it's something that stay in the game, in the fight and keep evolving because the opposition is always evolving. Um, Real quickly, if an MSP listening to this wants to get in touch with Tego Cyber and learn about what you guys are doing and see if maybe they can uh, layer that on top of their existing tech security stack, what's the best way to reach you guys? Um, probably the best person to reach is Brent. Um, but, I was afraid you know. you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, yeah, but I'm, I'm available I'm too. A, it's really easy. Yeah. Shannon.Wilkinson at TegoCyber.com is my email address. Um, no, Brent, I'm not Watkins, Brent, Brent you know, Watkins yeah. at Tego Cyber. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, you know, one of the things about the MSP community that may be of interest, if we've, we've got this pivot away from just legacy SIMs that are very expensive, we have a program going with the uh, Amazon Security Lake and Tego integrated over that. Sometimes that's a 70% cost savings or 80% cost savings over the legacy SIM thing. So that might be of more interest to the MSP community than some other communities. Very good point. So if you're an MSP and you're interested in, in, in that type of technology, give, uh, give Tego Cyber uh, a look 
talk to Shannon, talk to Brent. Um, they'll, they won't steer you wrong. Um, guys, thank you so much for, for coming on the uh, program. I hope maybe you'd be willing to come back in the future for uh, other, no doubt there are going to be other breaches and hacks and other stuff to talk about. So I uh, always would love to have you back on. No, absolutely. Because like I said, this legacy SIM thing is just getting hold, getting a hold and we'll have a lot more data in a little while, you know, in three, four five months, as far as cost savings and stuff like that. We'll have some more data that would probably be interesting to your MSP world, folks. Absolutely. Well, folks, that's all for now. Until next time, stay safe. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, please give us a like. Make sure you are subscribed to the podcast so you will get notified when future episodes are released. We will see you next time in the MSP Zone.